Hello everyone. So this is going to be the final video for lab number four. Uh, we're going to be talking about a disease called myasthenia gravis. Um, and we're going to review a few things about muscles before you get into it, just so you can kind of understand where we're coming from. Um, this is going to help you really understand um, moving forward about how our excitation and contraction coupling can be thrown off. And it will help you understand a little bit more into uh, the pharmacology of this and whatnot. Okay, so before we jump into talking about the disease, remember this picture. Do you see how at the top there, um, at the axon terminal of the somatic neuron, that you have these secretory vesicles of acetylcholine fusing with the me cell membrane and then being expelled into the synapse. Do you see how that is what's starting this whole um, action potential down the T-tubule and then later the release of calcium and the contra contraction itself. Um, this is pivotal to understanding diseases like myasthenia gravis. One of the early signs of myasthenia gravis is the inability to open up both eyelids on command. As you see in this picture, this individual doesn't have one eye just um, open and the other one closed, but this individual is actually trying to open up both of um, their eyes, but is unable to do so because of a muscle weakness uh, caused by a loss in cell signaling between the neuron and the uh, muscle cells. So let's quickly talk about the pathology of myasthenia gravis. The idea is that myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune, autoimmune disease meaning that our immune system is doing something to disrupt a normal body function. And in this case, our immune system is making antibodies that actually bind to our nicotinic receptors, making it so that acetylcholine cannot bind and therefore stimulate the muscle. This means that there cannot be a muscle contraction and we don't get any support to be able to open that eyelid like in the picture that we saw just before. One of the things that we can do to treat this disease is to focus in on that neuromuscular junction where we get our neuron and the terminal, terminal button to meet the motor end plate. Now what we're doing here is we have to think, okay, how can we get a signal to go through? So if our antibodies are bound to our nicotinic receptors, we can actually increase the concentration of acetylcholine inside of the synapse. And this is done by using an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. Acetylcholinesterase is a good thing. Um, in a normal healthy individual, um, what acetylcholinesterase does is it breaks down acetylcholine inside of the synapse. And what that does is it stops signaling to be overextensive or to prevent overstimulation of the muscle cell by the neuron. And by doing so, we don't run into the problems of tetany and whatnot. But in this case of a, a patient who has myasthenia gravis, we want more signaling because the signaling isn't getting through. So we want the acetylcholine to stay inside the synaptic cleft as long as possible so that the signal can get to the muscle and stimulate an action potential down the T-tubules of the muscle cell. Okay, so now with that very basic idea about what myasthenia gravis is, um, what's going wrong in the excitation contraction coupling uh, pathway, and, and how we treat it, um, now we're gonna ask you to think about what else could go wrong in that excitation coupling pathway that would stop um, a signal from being sent correctly. So if you look at this picture, try to think, okay, what could go wrong, what could go right? Um, what would happen if ruthenium red stopped the ranadine receptor from even being able to open? What would that do to a muscle contraction? Or what if uh, TBQ, if it shut down the calcium ATPase? Grasping a basic understanding of what these molecules and what other toxins like tetrodotoxin or curare um, do to the excitation contraction coupling pathway um, can really help solidify your understanding of how a normal um, excitation contraction pathway is supposed to progress. And these are all the things that can mess it up as well as 
it can give you insights of how other neuromuscular diseases um, work. Okay, so this concludes our last video for lab number four. Uh, thank you for watching.